Hi guys, you're welcome to Allogenous Ideas. In this video, we're going to be talking about computer hardware. So we're going to be talking about the functional units of a computer. We talk about the CPU, the main memory. Then we talk about the peripheral units, where we'll be discussing input device, the output devices, the auxiliary storage as well. Okay. So um, the computer consists of two broad components. We have the hardware and the software. So these two different components they come together to make up the. Um, to make up the computer itself. So hardware refers to the physical units of a computer. You can imagine your hardware, um, it's like the human body and the hardware is like the bones and the organs that make it uh, function. It's the physical stuff that you can touch. The physical stuff that you can touch you get those those are basically the the hardware then we have the software so the computer software refers to a set of instructions programs or data that enables a program to perform specific tasks so think of software as the instruction or rules that the brain which is the cpu in the case of the computer follows to do its job its job it's the tangible it's the intangible part that tells the computer what to do okay so the um, software will be discussed in another video entirely now computer hardware can be divided into three areas we have the central processing unit we have the main memory then we have the peripheral units as well all right so the central processing unit first the central processing unit is often referred to as the brain of the computer this is the hardware component responsible for executing instructions stored in the computer programs okay so the cpu performs calculations it makes decisions and it manages data movement within the computer modern cpus are highly complex featuring millions if not billions of transistors that work together to process information the CPU is typically composed of two main sections. We have the control unit, which you, which you can call the CU, and the arithmetic logic unit. So this control unit serves as the coordinator of the CPU, and its primary function is to manage the execution of instructions stored in a computer's memory. This is how it works. Instruction fetching. So the control unit retrieves program instructions from the computer's memory. These instructions are typically stored in the RAM, which we refer to as the random access memory. So it decodes the instruction. After fetching the instruction, the control unit will decode the instruction to understand what operation needs to be performed. Then the execution of the instruction. So the control unit directs um, the arithmetic logic unit. Okay. To, and the other components that are required to execute the decoded instructions okay the control unit will decode the instruction after decoding it it will understand okay this is the um, operation that needs to be performed then it will coordinate the execution by directing the other parts of the cpu to execute the decoded instructions then we have control signals the control units generate control signals that manage the flow of data between different components ensuring that the instructions are executed in the correct sequence so in essence the control unit is the boss is responsible for orchestrating the various tasks required to execute a program ensuring that each instruction is carried out in the accurate order all right so we have the arithmetic logic unit as well the arithmetic logic unit is the part of the cpu that performs mathematical and logical operations this is the breakdown of its functions arithmetic operations the arithmetic logic unit can perform basic arithmetic operations such as addition subtraction multiplication and division it handles numerical calculations as well and um numerical calculations essential for various computing tasks we also have logical operations the alu performs the logical operations like and or and not these operations are crucial for decision making uh, decision making processes and data manipulation we also have the comparison operations the alu compares the data and determines which one is greater than equal to less than and all those so this is fundamental for decision making in computer programs we also have bitwise oper op operations the arithmetic logic unit can uh, manipulate individual bits which are the smallest units of data in the computer all right bitwise operations are essential for low level data processing so in summary the control unit manages the flow of instruction and ensures their proper execution 
the arithmetic logic unit performs the actual calculations and logical operations necessary for a wide range of computing tasks. Together, these two components form the core of the CPU, driving the computational capabilities of a computer. So, um, under the hardware, that is basically all about the CPU. That is all about the CPU. The CPU is um, the basically the brain of the computer. So, the, it is subdivided into control units that um, is the boss basically. It fetches instructions and coordinates the execution of the instruction by the arithmetic logic units and any other um, necessary components depending on the instruction at hand. Okay. Now let's talk about the main memory. Let's talk about the main memory. So for the main memory, the main memory often referred to as RAM which is random access memory is a crucial component of a computer's architecture. It is the type of memory or volatile memory that is used to store data and machine code currently being used and processed by the computer. Now, unlike long-term storage devices such as the hard drives or the SSD drives, the main memory is temporary and loses its content when the power of the computer is turned off. Okay? Let's talk a bit about the history of this main memory. The history of computer memory has witnessed significant advancements evolving from early forms of mechanical and um, electrostatic memory to the revolutionary development of semiconductor memory. So this is a brief overview of um, the history of the main memory. So we, we have the early mechanical and electrostatic memories. So in the early days of computing, mechanical devices were used for memory. For instance, the punch card system. So I think I explained some of this in, um, so in a few videos back, so you can just check it out. Where holes were punched into cards. Holes punched into cards represent data, served as a form of early memory. So additionally, electrostatic um, storage tubes I think these storage tubes, they were used in first generation or second generation computers, were employed in uh, computers like the Selectron tube, which stored data as charged spots on cathode ray tubes. So we also have the magnetic core uh, memory. This magnetic core memory was um, a significant leap forward. So engineers formed a form of RAM using small magnetized rings cores. Each core could represent a binary bit. So the magnetic core memory was widely used in early computers, including mainframes and mini computers. It was reliable and offered non-volatility, meaning data was um, data persisted even when the power was turned off. We also have the semiconductor memories. So in the 1960s, the 1960s saw the introduction of early semiconductor memories in technologies. So metal oxide semiconductor technologies uh, emerged and researchers began experimenting with using semiconductors as memory elements. However, early semiconductor memories was not as reliable as the magnetic core memory and had limitations in terms of the capa capacity and the stability as well. So we have the dynamic RAM, which you can refer to as the DRAM. In the early 1970s, the development of dynamic RAM marked a major breakthrough. So the DRAM used a capacitor to store each bit of data and it needed to be periodically refreshed to maintain the stored information. So the DRAM was faster and more cost effective compared to the magnetic core, paving the way for its widespread adoption in personal computers and other computing devices. We also have the static RAM. This static RAM is another type of semiconductor memory that doesn't require periodic refreshing, okay? Making it faster than the DRAM. So the static RAM is used in cache memory and other applications where, where speed is crucial. It is becoming an integral part of computer systems complementing the use of the DRAM, okay? So this cache memory, for example, if there are some particular websites where you will open them and if you open them the first time you load the website it will download a cache to your web browser such that if you are visiting the website again it will load the cache for you first improving um, increasing user experience improving the user experience then it will update it over time okay so cache memory I think they use it in the development of Facebook extensively so when you load a particular page, it will give you that particular page currently. Then if you are visiting that, that same page again, you won't have to load the whole page since a good portion of the page have been downloaded to your computer. So it will load that form that is downloaded on your computer first, 
then it will be updating it as needed. So that is just an example of cache anyway. So we also have the flash memory. So this flash memory, a type of non-volatile semiconductor memory, was developed in the 1980s and became commercially available in the 1990s. Flash memory is widely used in devices like the USB drives, memory cards, SSD drives, and um, it is non-volatile. It's non-volatile in nature and fast read access. I've made it a key component in modern modern storage systems. All right. So the advantages of the semiconductor technology over the years, advancements in semiconductor technologies have led to development of smaller more powerful and energy efficient memory devices. Integrated circuits with increasing transistor density have enabled the creation of memory modules with larger capacities and faster speed. Okay, The progression from mechanical and electrostatic memory to semiconductor memory has been instrumental in shaping the capabilities of modern computers. Semiconductor memory with its various forms, such as the DRAM, the SRAM, and the flash memory, continues to play a crucial role in meeting the ever-increasing demands for faster, more reliable, and higher capacity storage solutions in today's computing landscape. So here are um, key aspects of the main memory. So we have um, volatility. The main memory is very volatile, meaning that it loses its content anytime you turn off the computer. So this is in contrast to non-volatile storage such as the SSD, the HDD, which even retain data when the power is off. We also have speed. Main memory is, more, is much faster than longer term storage. It provides quick access to data, allowing the CPU to read and write information rapidly. So this speed is crucial for efficient operation of a computer. We also have the temporary storage. The main memory serves as the temporary workspace for a computer. Okay, When you run a program or open a file, the relevant data is loaded from the long time storage into the main memory for quick access by the CPU. All right? So we also have the direct, access, the direct accessibility. The term random access in RAM, RAM is random access memory. The term random access indicates that any bit of memory can be directly accessed without having to go through um, all the preceding bytes. So this direct uh, accessibility is essential for the quick retrieval of data. Okay. So types of main memory, we have the RAM, which is the random access memory. This is the type of main memory used in most computers. It is used for actively running programs and temporarily storing data. RAM is volatile and its contents are cleared when power is turned off. We have the cache memory. A smaller, faster type of memory that stores frequently accessed data for quicker retrieval by the CPU. For example, what I just um, explained, that there is a type of data that every time, perhaps um, consistently, the, us the user retrieves the data often. So why not just create a cache memory for that particular data? So that every time the user requests for that data, you will respond with that, the contents of the cache memory. So that, but you will update as needed every time there is something new to add to the cache memory, all right? So then we have the virtual memory, an extension of the physical memory that uses part of the hard drive to simulate additional RAM when the physical memory is full. So the role in program execution, when you open a program or a file, the relevant data is loaded from the long time storage, like the hard drive, into the main memory. The CPU then processes this data from the main memory, as it is much faster than fetching data directly from the storage devices. So the capacity consideration, the capacity of main memory is a crucial factor in a computer's performance. In modern computers, having sufficient RAM ensures that multiple applications can run simultaneously without significant slowdowns. In summary, main memory, which is the RAM, plays a vital role in the day-to-day -day functioning of a computer. It provides high-speed, volatile workspace for the CPU to quickly access and manipulate data during the execution of programs. 
So that will be all for the main memory. If you remember vividly, we are, we are going to be talking about the CPU, which we have done, the main memory. Then the last part, we have the peripheral units, which is going to consist of the input devices, the output devices, and the auxiliary storage devices. So now, moving down to the peripheral units. Now, computer peripheral units are devices connected to a computer that expands its functionality and capabilities. So, see this as a form of extension to extend the to enable the computer the computer to do way more than it is um act that it has capacity to do normally. For example, I'm on Chrome web browser, you can see all these extensions I have over here. When you install them, you'll be able to, the, your Chrome web browser will be able to do way more than it would be able to do normally, all right? So you can see peripheral units in that light. So these peripherals interact with the computer, providing input, receiving output, or serving additional storage functions. They allow users to interact with the computer system and enhance its utility for various um, tasks. The subdivision of peripheral units. So peripheral units are often categorized into three main types based on their primary functions. We have the input devices, the output devices, and we have the auxiliary storage devices. So talking of the input devices, just a summary of the three of them. Input devices are used to feed data and commands into the computer. All right. You use input devices to feed data and commands into the computer. They facilitate communication from the external environment into the computer. Examples of input devices include the keyboard. The keyboard allows users to input alphanumeric characters and commands. We have the mouse which enables pointing, clicking, and dragging actions. We have the touch screen as well. Response to touch gestures for input. We have the scanner. Converts physical documents or images into digital format. Then we have the microphone, with which I'm recording, for example, which captures audio input for voice commands or recording. So we have the output devices as well. The output devices present information processed by the computer to the user in a human readable form. Don't forget, um, a computer is an electronic machine. It will accept the data first. After accepting the data, it will not process the data. After processing the data, it will not just process the data for no reason. It will process the data so some sort of output has to be shown to the user that performed the action. So the input device is what you are using to feed the data and commands to the computer. Output devices are used to present information processed by the computer. All right. They convert electronic data into a format that is understandable and usable. Understandable and usable. Examples of output devices include the monitor, uh, or the display which presents visual information and graphics for example your desktop um, your desktop screen yes your tv and all those we have the printer produces hard copies of documents or images we have the speaker as well outputs audio for various applications such as your music or um, sound system we have the projector which displays computer components on a larger screen or surface so we have the headphones which provides audio output for private um, listening. So we have the auxiliary storage devices. Um, the auxiliary storage devices are used to store data for the long term, all right, beyond the volatile nature of the main memory. They enable the retrieval and retention of information even when the computer is turned off. Examples of auxiliary storage devices include the hard drives, which the SSD, the SSD, the HDD, which is the hard disk drive, offers large capacity, non-volatile storage for the operating system, software, and user data. We also have solid state drives, similar to an HDD, but use flash memory for faster access speeds. We have the USB flash drive, which is more portable. It is a removable storage device. We have the external hard drive, additional often larger storage connected externally to the computer. Then we have the CD, the DVD, Blu-ray drives. So the one you use together with your CD-ROM or your uh, compact disc uh, players at home. So, so the subdivisions into input, output, and auxiliary storage devices helps organize the diverse arrays, array of peripherals based on their primary functions. These devices 
collectively contribute to a comprehensive and interacting interactive computing experience allowing users to input information receive output and store data for future use so the peripheral devices now can be classified into three the inputs the output then the peripheral then the auxiliary storage devices input we use them to feed data and commands into the computer um the the output use it to present data process data in a form that the human can understand and can use the and the auxiliary storage devices they are used as um some sort of secondary storage okay so the, the, now let's talk about the input devices the computer input devices they serve as um essential conduits between the users and the computer system with document readers, specialized technologies like MICR, OMR and OCR offering distinct capabilities. So I'm going to be talking about the document reader now. The document readers are pivotal, are pivotal input devices designed to convert physical documents into a digital format for seamless integration with computer systems. They play a crucial role in tasks such as data entry, document archiving, and information retrieval. Document readers encompass scanners, okay? So scanners utilizing optical sensors. Scan, scan, scanners capture images or text from physical documents, translating them into a digital format. For example, um, your passport, you might have to make a photocopy. You put it into a scanner, it creates a photocopy for you. You might have to photocopy your passport or any other important um, documents for use. So we also have the document cameras. Tailored cameras designed to capture real-time images of documents or objects commonly used in the educational and um, presentation setting. All right. Now let's talk about the MICR, which is the Magnetic Ink Character Recognition. So the MICR represents a specialized technology that employs magnetic ink and distinctive characters to encode information on documents, particularly prevalent in the banking industry for processing checks. All right. The MICR input device, such as MICR readers, employ magnetic sensors to swiftly and accurately capture data encoded in the magnetic ink um, characters on checks, ensuring secure and efficient uh, processing. All right. We also have the OMR. Uh, the OMR technology is specifically designed for recognizing capturing data from marked fields on the paper. Frequently utilized in surveys, exams, and assessments with multiple choice formats, OMR input devices include OMR scanners, identify and interpret marks made with pencils or pens in predetermined areas on paper, streamlining data collection in standardized formats. All right, this OMR technology um, it was it is used extensively in the educational sector where you prove you provide um. Uh, they call it OBJ kind of uh, exams or tests. So you, they give you an OMR sheet. You have the four options A to E, for example. For number one, you will see the option to tick A, B, or C, or any other option you want to tick. So instead of marking all those scripts manually, imagine that you have 4,000 scripts to 4,000 OMR sheets to mark. So you just feed everything into the computer, the machine. The machine will mark everything manually and you are good to go all right so it will save you time so we have the ocr um the optical character recognition the ocr stands out as a sophisticated technology that transforms printed or handwritten text into machine encoded texts integrated into scanners or available as standalone ocr devices ocr input devices meticulously analyze the shapes and patterns of characters in an image to extract readable text. This technology finds widespread application in digitizing printed documents, enhancing the accessibility and enabling searchable database. All right. So um, these specialized input devices, including document readers and technologies like these three, they significantly broaden the computer's capabilities. They not only facilitate efficient data, data entry but also contributes to the automation of documents processing error reduction and improved overall task efficiency all right making them invaluable in diverse industries and um, applications so
that will be all for the input devices for now. Let's talk about the output devices. For the output devices, um, they play a crucial role in delivering information from a computer system to the user in a comprehensible and usable format. Don't forget, the user has to be able to understand and use the information being presented. So these devices translate processed data and results into a form that can be perceived by humans. So common computer output devices include monitors or displays which present visual information such as text, images and graphics. Printers generate hard copies of documents enabling a tangible representation of digital content. All right. So we have um, the printer, the visual display unit, we have the com computer output in microfilm, the graphics and the magnetically encoded ones. So I will just leave this one out for now. I'll leave this one out for now. So talking about the printers. Printers, um, critical devices in the world of computing, they come in two main types. We have the impact printers and the non-impact printers. So each type serves distinct purposes, employing unique mechanisms to produce to reproduce digital content on paper. All right. So as for the impact printers, we have the dot matrix uh, printers. So a resilient workers dot matrix printers utilize a matrix of pins to strike an ink an ink tribune, creating characters and images through patterns of dots known for their durability and ability to produce multi-part multi forms. They find application in business requiring carbon copy printing, all right? So we have the daisy wheel printers as well. So I think I'm supposed to explain something first. The impact printers, um, in case of the impact printers, the, there should be some sort of impact between the, a component of the printer and the paper where the document is supposed to be reproduced. That is how the impact printers work. For the non-impact printers, there is no contact between the paper and what is actually drawing out the, the patterns on the paper. So let's, let's just continue. So the daisy wheel printers operating with a wheel or disc adorned with character impression. Daisy wheel printers meticulously rotate to the desired character before striking an inked ribbon. All right. While slower than dot matrix printer, they excel in producing high quality text and are suitable for environments with moderate printing needs. We have the line printers, which are ideal for high volume printing in industrial settings. Line printers accomplish the task by printing an entire line of text at once. They are commonly employed in data centers for tasks demanding speed and um, efficiency. So the non-impact printers, we have the laser printers, harnessing a laser beam to form an electrostatic image on photosensitive drum. Laser printers use toner, all right, a powdered ink attracted to charge areas on the drum. The toner is transferred to the paper and fused using heat, delivering high speed and high quality output, making laser printers popular for office environments. We also have the ink jet printers. Employ tiny droplets of ink sprayed onto paper. Inkjet printers are versatile devices suitable for both text and photo printing. They are prevalent in, in homes and offices, offering flexibility in producing a range of print materials. We also have the dye sublimation printers utilizing heat to transfer solid dye into special, into special papers. So dye sublimation Dye sublimation printers excel in producing high quality photo prints with continuous tone output. They are favored in professional photography for the ability to render vibrant and detailed images. We also have the thermal printers as well, employing heat to produce images on special thermal papers. Thermal printers are commonly used in point of sale systems. All right, label printing and portable applications. This process involves selectively heating the paper to create text or images without the need for ink toner for ink or toner so as technology advances non-impact printers 
particularly the laser, the laser and the inkjet printers, dominate the market due to their versatility, superior print quality, and adaptability to various printing needs. The choice between impact and non-impact printers depends on the specific requirement, considering factors such as the print volume, the speed, and the nature of the printed material. Another thing one we want to consider is the cost as well and the availability. So. We also have the visual display unit, which is the VDU, commonly known as a monitor or screen. It's a vital computer output device that visually renders digital information for user interaction. Monitors come in various types. They come in various types, including the CRT, LCD, LED, and the OLED, each employing distinct technologies to display images. The resolution, refresh rate, response time, and color depth are key technical specifications that influence the visual quality of a VDU. Additionally, features such as connectivity, options, size, aspect ratio, adjustability, and special functionalities contribute to the overall usability and user experience of the monitor. Visual display units play a crucial role in providing users with a visual interface to interact with their computers, making them an integral component of modern computing systems. So we also have the computer output in microfilm. The computer output in microfilm, and wait, um, before going to the computer output in microfilm, so this VDU, if you have been to a plane, um, I think every person there has this um, a bit of tab at the just in front of them that they can use to do one or two. If you are in a very, some exotic cars too, they have these visual display units as well. Um, that a, just a little computer in front of them, just at the back of the owner or the driver side. So visual display units are everywhere. They are everywhere basically. So we have the computer output in microfilm as well. So they refer to the process of transforming digital, informa in digital information generated by a computer into a microfilm format for long-term storage, archival purposes, or secure data preservation. So microfilm is a roll or sheet of photographic film containing mic micro photographs, reduced copies of documents, or computer-generated content. This method is especially useful for organizations or institutions that require durable and compact storage solution for a large volume of information. If you've seen the film of um, a of a camera before, you will understand this thing better. Um, the cameras they used in those days before digital cameras came on that you can store your images in a memory card. So those days, you will see the microfilms that um, cameras use. So you put the microfilm into the camera. If they want to print out the, if you want to get a hard copy of the image, they take the microfilm to a photo lab where they will process the image, basically. So that is what uh, I'm talking about here. The process typically involves using a microfilm recorder or camera to capture the computer generated data into a special photosensitive film. The film is then developed, produced, producing a microfilm reel or sheet containing a compact representation of the original digital content. Microfilm offers advantages such as space efficiency, longevity, resistance to environmental factors, making it a reliable choice for preservation of important records in historical documents and other critical information. While modern storage technologies have largely replaced the microfilm for everyday data storage, it remains relevant in situations where physical archival copies are required for legal, historical, or regulatory reasons. So we also have the computer graphics. So talking about the computer graphics, they refer to creation, manipulation, and representation of visual images and animations Using computers, it encompasses a wide range of applications from, say, 2D graphics like icons, illustrations, to 3D graphics. Used in video games, simulations, and computer-aided design. So graphic software and programming languages are employed to generate and manipulate images, allowing users to, conf to convey information, express creativity, and simulate virtual environments. So now, for you to generate computer graphics. You need some specialized output devices for computer graphics. 
So once computer graphics are generated by a computer, they need to be displayed in an output device. Common output devices used for computer graphics, we have the monitors or displays, basically these um, visual display units. Then we also have the printers which I've explained of. We have the projectors, I've explained the projectors to... Projectors are used to display computer generated graphics on larger screens or surfaces, making them suitable for presentations, lectures or entertainment purposes. Graph plotters are specialized output devices that use pens or markers to create precise, detailed drawings on paper. They are often used in engineering and design applications. In summary, computer graphics is a field that involves creating and manipulating visual images using computers, output devices such as monitors and printers, projectors and plotters, then display or reproduce these graphics for users to interact with or share in various contexts okay now the final one we're going to be talking about the auxiliary storage devices so these auxiliary storage de devices known as the secondary storage are external devices that can store data for a long time even when the computer is turned off unlike the primary storage which is the ram which is volatile and loses data when power is turned off auxiliary storage is non-volatile this makes it essential for storing important files, documents, applications, and media. So the types that we are going to be talking about, we have the hard disks, the soft disks, then we have the integrated disks as well. So talk of the, the as for the hard disks, if you come to under the auxiliary storage devices, I've explained um, the, the hard disks extens uh, here. So that is why I'm not covering them downstairs. So this is where I have them. Okay, I think I explained them here too. So, so we have the soft disks and the integrated disks. Now let's talk about the Winchester disks. The term Winchester um, disk originated as a code name from an influential early hard disk drive, HDD, developed by International Business Machines, which is IBM, in the 1970s. So the IBM 3340 often referred to as the Winchester drive was groundbreaking for its fixed head design where the read write heads remained stationary while the um, platters which are the discs spawn this design marked a departure from earlier removable head drives contributing to increased storage density and reliability they play a pivotal role in the advancing storage technology by offering higher capacities measured in megabytes. It became a standard in mainframe and mini computer systems, meeting the growing demand for larger and faster storage solutions. While the term Winchester is less commonly used today, its legacy is evident in the evolution of hard disk drives and the broader landscape of data storage technologies. The innovations introduced by Winchester drives set the stage for the development of modern HDDs, solid-state drives, and other high-capacity storage solutions that are integral to contemporary computing. So the next one we're talking about the hard drives, all right? So the hard drives, which are the HDDs, they are traditional auxiliary storage devices that use magnetic storage to store and retrieve data. They consist of spinning disks, platters, coated with a magnetic material, and data is read, is read or written using a read-write head that moves across the spinning platters. Characteristics HDDs offer high storage capacities and are commonly used in computers for long-term data storage. They are cost-effective but have mechanical components that may impact speed and durability. We also have the solid-state drives. The solid-state drives are newer auxiliary storage devices that use NAND, NAND-based uh, flash memory to store data. Unlike HDDs, they have no moving parts, which contributes to their faster data access speeds and increased durability. SSDs are known for their high-speed performance, reliability, and energy efficiency. They are commonly used in laptops, desktops, and servers to provide faster data access and improved system responsiveness. Um, we also have the optical disks. So, optical disks are removable auxiliary storage devices that use optical technology to read and write data. Common types include the CD-ROMs, 
the DVDs and the Blu-ray disc. If you remember the um, uh, those days when you have the compact discs or DVDs at home, so the CDs themselves, that, those are what you refer to as optical discs. They are store they store data as uh, pits and lands on the disc's uh, surface, which is read by laser by laser. So basically, your DVD, your CD, they use uh, laser technology to read the data contained on the CD, which is then sent to the television to be uh, presented. So characteristics of the optical disks. The optical disks are used for storing various types of data, including software, music, movies, and backups. They offer portability but have lower storage capacities compared to the HDDs and to the SSDs. So we also have the soft disks. So don't forget if you come here we have the hard disk, we have the soft disks, then we have the integrated disk. So that will be all about the hard disks. Now let's talk about the soft disks. So soft disks are basically referred to as the floppy disks. They are they are not in use anymore. So the term soft disks is often associated with a more commonly used term floppy disk or floppy disk. So they were uh, portable and medium widely used in the 20th, 20th century. These flexible magnetic storage devices played a crucial role in early personal computing. For the physical characteristics, they are thin flexible plastic squares enclosed in a protective casing. They were available in various sizes with the 3.5 inch and the 5.25 inch format being the most common. The floppy designation comes from the flexible, flexible nature of the disk. For the storage capacity, floppy disks had a modest storage capacity. They had modest storage capacities, typically measured in kilobytes or megabytes. The 3.5 inch disk, which later became the standard, could store 1.14 megabytes of data, just imagine. <laughs> While the older 5.25 inch disks had um, lower capacities. As for the data transfer and usage, users could write and read data to and from the floppy disk using the floppy disk drives on computers. Floppies were used for storing files, applications, and even serving as a bootable medium for operating system as well. They were commonly used to share and distribute software and data. Limited durability. Floppy disks had some drawbacks include, including vulner, vulnerability to physical damage, data corruption and limited durability. Exposure to magnetic fields or physical mishandling could lead to data loss. Then it is phased out. As technology advanced, floppy disks were gradually phased out in favor of more robust and higher capacity storage solutions like the CD-ROMs the USB drives and the online or cloud storage. The decline in floppy disk usage became pronounced in the early 2000s. So, although largely obsolete today, the floppy disk remains an icon of the early personal computing era. It played a crucial role in the history of data storage, paving the way for subsequent innovations in portable and high capacity storage technologies. Talking of the size of um, floppy disks, so they came in various sizes and formats throughout their history. The two most common sizes are the 3.5 and the 2.5 inch. So we have the 8 inch floppy disk. So the size is 8 inches and um, the usage in the early 1970s. Then we have the 5.25 inch floppy disk. You can see the size. The capacity was varied over time between 160 kilobyte and 1.2 MB, I think. Then the usage commonly used in personal computers during the late 1970s to the 1980s. We have the 3.5 inch floppy disks. The capacity, I think the most common capacity was 1.44 MB. So the later versions were increased a bit. So you can see the usage. So in the late 1980s and 1990s, continuing into early 2000s, we also have the double-sided, the double-density floppy disk. So you can see more information about it. We have the high-density floppy disk. We have the extra-high-density floppy disk. You can see it. 
then the super disk you can see the super disk over here can store up to 240 mb so these variations in size density and technology reflect the evolutions of floppy disk over time as computing needs and storage technologies were advanced the 3.5 inch floppy disk in particular became a standard for many years before being largely replaced by more advanced storage solutions so um, now let's talk more about the optical disk so for the optical disk we have the cd-rom the right ones read many um would we have the right table magneto optical disk yes so as for the optical disk the definition optical disk uh, storage media that uses laser technology to read and write data they consist of a reflective surface um, with microscopic uh, pits and lands that represent binary data the laser reads this, these variations to retrieve information so like i said the other time the op optical disks they use laser technology to read data so the type of data we have the the type of optical disks we have the compact disks which we refer to as the cds we have the digital um, versatile disks we have the blu-ray disk so they were largely used for storing and distributing digital contents basically we have the cd-rom compact disk read only memory so cd-roms are optical disks that store data in read only format meaning that data can be read from them but not rewritten to them they play a pivotal role in distributing software and games and multimedia content in the 1990s and early 2000s so they, they have a capacity of approximately 700 mb so we also have the right ones and read many um, optical disks so you can call them warm so warm optical disk allow data to be written to them once after which the data becomes permanent and cannot be altered this right ones feature makes them suitable for archiving purposes and ensuring data integrity the use case so they are used in applications where data needs to be stored securely and remain unaltered such as legal and financial records okay we also have the rewritable magneto optical disks the rewritable magneto optical disk use a combination of magnetic and optical technologies data can be written erased and rewritten on these disks they offer the advantage of being reusable allowing users to update and modify the stored information so the capacity varied but it can go as high as 2.3 gig so the key distinction distinction the cd-rom versus the worm cd-roms are read only while the worm disk allow a one-time write offering a balance between permanence and limited adaptability we also have the magneto optical versus the um, write once read uh, many uh, storage so the magneto optical disk they are rewritable providing flexibility for data updates whereas warm disk are right ones ensuring data integrity but limited modifications okay as for the legacy and the current current use optical disks especially the cd-roms were once um ubiquitous for software distribution while their usage has declined with the rise of digital downloads and streaming optical disks particularly warm and uh, magneto optical variants are still employed in certain industries for secure and archival storage needs all right we also have the integrated disks as well this the integrated disks the, you can call them embedded flash memory so they are relatively new type of auxiliary storage devices that are becoming increasingly popular in mobile devices like smartphones tablets and laptops unlike traditional auxiliary storage options like the hard disk the hard um, drive the hard disk drives and the solid state drives integrated disks are sold out directly to the motherboard of the device so integrated disks are a promising technology that offers significant advantages for mobile devices their smaller size faster data access lower power consumption and greater durability makes them well suited for the needs of modern users while their limited storage capacity and higher costs may be limitation for some the benefits offered by integrated disks are expected to make them an increasingly popular choice in the future of mobile computing so that will be all for the computer hardware lecture 
So in this particular lecture, we spoke about the functional unit of a computer. I explained the um, the meaning of the software and the hardware. Then we have the um, under the functional units of a computer can be partitioned into three parts. We have the CPU, which is the brain of the computer, consists of the control unit and the arithmetic logic unit. Then I spoke about the main memory, then the peripheral unit, where I spoke about input devices, output devices, and the auxiliary storage devices as well. So thank you very much. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe, drop your comments. Um, we'll respond to it as soon as we can. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next lecture.